Welcome to this third session of New Testament, learning more about the New Testament from Bucky Baptist Church. It's a lovely sunny day in Bucky here on the 3rd of October. The reason I wanted to do this and we wanted to do this was just questions that were being asked um, about the difference between the Old and the New Testament and different questions uh, made me want to do something that just simply explains what the New Testament is about. So I want to encourage you to learn to how to navigate through the Bible and learn the different books of the Bible. And also, as I'm speaking, uh, I will reference parts of the New Testament, parts of the Bible. Just take a moment to press pause as you're listening and to go to your Bible and read that passage. I want to stop and read every passage, but it's great that we can p press pause and go, and it's really discovering, it's exploring the Bible, this sessions on the New Testament, where explorers wanted to find out what the Bible is about and what the Bible is saying to us today. The New Testament is about our Lord Jesus Christ. And to know the Lord Jesus as Savior is the greatest thing that you can do in your life to make that decision for Christ. But also, not only to know, but to grow. And to grow as a Christian, uh, to grow is to read your Bible. The wee chorus says it well. Read your Bible and pray every day and you'll grow, grow, grow. And the Bible has given us the information and we take that information and apply it to our lives. There's application which brings transformation. So let me encourage myself and you to be a people that will take time to read our Bibles. This is our third session, but the first session we did was on why Jesus? Why Jesus? Well, the first week we looked at Savior. He came to save us from our sins, to rescue us. And we will look at how he did this when we come to the cross. But it's so important that the Lord Jesus came to save because the consequences, and again we did that, is eternal separation from God if we are not saved from our sins. Because hell is a real place mentioned in the Bible. So judgment and wrath are serious things and eternity is serious. So to know the Lord Jesus as Savior is so important. It is the most important thing. But also, we did the following week was, who is Jesus? He is fully God and he is fully man. We're coming up to Christmas time and I trust that being, watching this and learning about the Lord Jesus will make us all think differently when we look at the baby in Bethlehem's manger to realize who he was, who is he? He is fully man and fully God. And this week, we're looking at week three, the life of Jesus and the impact of his life, death and resurrection is felt today, 2,000 years on, with all over the world, people giving their lives to Christ and being followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. The life of Jesus is a remarkable life. When you study it in the Gospels, I can only stand in awe of a sinless, spotless, pure life. One solitary life. This is just something that I came across a number of years ago. I see it uh, appearing from time to time in different uh, Christian periodicals or on the internet. And it's just take a time to read it because it's, it's worth reading that. I'm not going to read it, press pause, and read about the remarkable life that somebody has written about the Lord Jesus. But the Lord Jesus Christ has dominated history. He has dominated um, in so many different ways. And he's captivated people. Not that everyone that he has captivated has turned to him. But people 
have, as these following quotes show their respect or their admiration or awe. One was a Jewish author who said that Jesus Christ to me is the outstanding personality of all time, all history, both as son of God and as son of man. Others like A.G. Wells, British author, author said, I am an historian, I'm not a believer, but I must confess as a historian that this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in all history. Someone else was Napoleon. Again, it's worth uh, reading what he says. I know men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. And again, just read that, what Napoleon said. If you've been watching Oppenheimer, you'll notice Albert Einstein is on it. And what he says, again, I am a Jew, but I am thralled by the luminous figure of the Nazarene. Jesus is too colossal for the pen of phrase mongers, however artful. And just again, take time to read that. But as, as I say, everyone doesn't hold that. The, the name of the Lord Jesus is used as a swear word. But for those of us who are Christians, we love our Savior and we want others to come to know him too. So what's the date today? Which year is it? And when was you born? Well, these times, these dates, all here tell us uh, the terms AD and BC have their roots in Christianity. The system labels years based when Jesus was born, with the AD denoting years after his birth, and BC designating the years that predate his birth, which is quite remarkable that every day our date and our calendar comes from the time when the Lord Jesus Christ was born. Questions we ask or are asked is, where are you from? And when you read a biography or autobiography, they go back and tell you things about the person's life, where they were born, and, and so on. And these are questions that we ask, or sometimes we're asked, where are you from? Well, I'm, I'm from Scotland. Where was you born? I was born in Bucky. Where do you live? I lived in Bucky for a few months. I lived in Portnockie, and now I live in Cullen. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Portnockie. What do you work at? Well, I left the school at 16 and became a fisherman, and then I went into selling fish, and now I'm pastor of Bucky Baptist Church. So these are questions that we wonder and that we are asked. But we ask, do you wonder these questions about Jesus? Where are you from? Where was you born? Where do you live? Where did you grow up? What do you work at? And we'll ask these questions about the Lord Jesus Christ today. And where we find out about them is in the New Testament, in Matthew, in Mark, Luke, and John. The Old Testament, as we did in week two, all points forward to the Lord Jesus. And also, there are 27 books in the New Testament. These are the first four, but the others two are about the Lord Jesus. And the book of Revelation shows us the ending of everything and how the Lord Jesus Christ will bring history to the close and will reign. And so the whole Bible is about the Savior. So where are you from is the first question we look at as to the Lord Jesus today. And before Jesus was born, he lived in heaven with his father. Last week we did that, the last time, the pre-existence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we looked at the fellowship with the Father from all eternity, the creator of everything. He sustains everything. The next question, where was you born? Well, the Lord Jesus was born in Israel. You can see it in a map, a tiny uh, country uh, at the eastern, eastern side of the Mediterranean Sea and in a small place called Bethlehem. Where do you live? Well, the Lord Jesus lived. He was born in Bethlehem. He, when he was young, 
He had, his parents took him to Egypt because of Herod's plot to, to destroy all the boys under the age of two. But an angel warned Joseph in a dream, a dream to take the family to Egypt. And they stayed there till Herod died. Possibly when the Lord Jesus was age two. And then they moved back to Nazareth. And the Lord Jesus in his ministry in Capernaum. And then his life ended in Jerusalem where he was crucified. The shadow of the cross lay across the, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. His destiny was to be crucified in Jerusalem upon a cross. Where did you grow up? Well, the first 30 years of Jesus' life was in Nazareth. His mother Mary, his earthly father Joseph. Jesus had brothers and sisters. He was brought up in Nazareth. He was brought up in the Jewish faith. He attended the synagogue. And that's why sometimes you will read the words in the Gospels, Jesus of Nazareth. And what do you work at? In Nazareth, Jesus lived and worked till he was 30 years old. And he worked as a carpenter. We have that re reference in Mark chapter 6, verse 3. Is this not the carpenter? And then the next three to four years of the life from 30 years old was lived in Capernaum by the Sea of Galilee with occasional trips to Jerusalem. It's very interesting that in the life of the Lord Jesus, between the age of two and 30, there is only one reference to his life, and that is in Luke chapter three, where we're told when the Lord Jesus was 12 years old. So here at the age of 30 in Capernaum, the Lord Jesus from this Capernaum base, he would teach and preach and perform miracles. And again, we read that in the Gospels. The Lord Jesus, age 30, began what we speak of as his public ministry. Between the ages up to 30, he was in Nazareth, but now working as a carpenter, but now at the age of 30, he begins his public ministry of teaching, of preaching, and performing miracles. And Matthew records this from chapter 3 on, Mark from chapter 1, Luke from chapter 3, and John from chapter 1. If you go to these and read these chapters, you will notice, apart from John, that each of them, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, tell us that the Lord Jesus began his public ministry after he was baptized. But each of them, at this point, make reference that the Holy Spirit came upon the Lord Jesus. And when we go into further studies in the New Testament, we will see the importance of the Holy Spirit in our lives as Christians. But we're not going to jump ahead. We're just going, to, we're just going slowly through to understand in the New Testament. In that moment, we're in the Gospels and we're looking at the Lord Jesus, age 30, beginning his public ministry. But Jesus taught where? He taught by the sea. He taught in the temple. He taught in synagogues. He taught in a house. He taught from a boat. He taught up a mountain. He taught in a field. So the Lord Jesus taught, he preached and teached in many different places. He taught both individuals. He spoke to Nicodemus. He gave Nicodemus that great truth that Nicodemus needed to be born again, born anew. He spoke to the crowds. And Jesus taught in sermons. He taught in parables. A parable is a story taken out of ordinary life used to drive home a spiritual or moral truth. You can find one was the parable of the sower went forth to sow. And the sowers would have been going forth to sow in the fields in Israel at that time. So the Lord Jesus takes that and uses it as a story to illustrate some important spiritual truths. But he taught in conversations too. Jesus wanted to reveal the Father. He wanted us to know God. And we can know God from creation. We look out and we see the sun shining and we look at the magnificence of creation. We look at our magnificence as how God created us 
And we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And we're created in the image of God. But he wanted us to know the heart of God, the love of God. And that's why in the Gospels we have a verse like John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him may not perish but have life eternal. And the Lord Jesus taught in the parables. One was the parable of the younger son or the prodigal son who went into the far country. He messed up his life. And that was after asking his father for half of his possessions. But when he came back, he did not know what kind of reception he would get from his father. But the father ran and covered him with kisses and put the best robe on him and the sandals on his feet. And that was the Lord Jesus teaching the heart and the compassion and the love of God. When we repent as sinners and we come to God, we come and we seek God's forgiveness. The Lord Jesus says, this is how amazing it is. That God runs and he embraces us and he, he covers us with kisses, the kisses of forgiveness and welcomes us into his family. And I encourage you to press the pause button and read Luke chapter 15 verses 10 to 27. And again, learn that parable because it teaches a great truth. Also, he taught sermons and one of the, the sermons that's uh, very well known is the Sermon on the Mount. And again, the sermon there is in chapter 5, 6, and 7. And how relevant is that teaching today as it was then? This week is a Tory conference. And again, they will have their manifesto. And the different polit political parties will have their manifesto. And it changes from year to year. But the manifesto of the King of Kings never changes. And the teachings of the Lord Jesus are just as relevant today as they were then. It's as if he is speaking today. And this one in Matthew 6, verse 25 to 34, again, press the pause button. And three times in that section, the Lord Jesus says, do not worry. Now the sun's shining today and it's warm, but we're coming into winter. And we worry about things like our heating bills. We worry about money. We worry about the rise in food prices. There's so much things that we worry, we can worry about in life. And yet I can come to this passage in Matthew and listen to the teachings of the Lord Jesus. And he speaks into my life as a Christian and he says, do not worry. And three times he says, do not worry. That's his teachings but in his sermons and parables, Jesus spoke on salvation. He spoke on discipleship, being a follower, the kingdom of God, the rule of God in our lives. He spoke of God, but also he gave warnings. He spoke of his second coming. He spoke of serving. There is just so many things in the teaching of the Lord Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John also give us the miracles of Jesus. The miracles of Jesus are, there are numerous ones. There is a paralytic who was let down uh, through the roof, who was healed. There was the feeding of the 5,000, or the other one, the 4,000. There was Jairus' daughter being raised to life after she died. There is the lepers that came, the blind that came. Also the men who were in the tombs, the two men, uh, with demons and in each of them the, we find the compassion and the love of Christ and in these different situations and into the different homes and families the Lord Jesus brought hope and where there was despair he came in and performed a miracle and brought hope and that's exactly the same today the Lord Jesus comes in to our lives we trust him we pray, we believe, and he changes situations. He turns things around. He transforms our life. And he brings hope where there is despair. He brings peace where there is uncertainty. He brings joy where there is sadness. And that is what the Lord Jesus Christ does. The greatest miracle is the miracle of new birth when we're born again and we come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of the other miracles 
of the Lord Jesus is Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 to 13. The leper cleansed, the paralyzed man healed. I've just highlighted these two, again, to press the pause button and to go and read them. And just be amazed as you read these um, miracles. I'm going to read one, and it's found in Mark chapter 10, verse 46 to 52. I feel maybe that this one always resonates with me because I had two aunties, one died and one is still alive, who were both blind. And seeing them, when I was young, I used to think, I wish that Jesus could give them sight because to have sight is a great gift and to lose your sight is really hard. And so this one here I will read because it must have been a great day in Bartimaeus' life when he was healed. It's in Mark 10, verse 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar. It's not only that he was blind, he was a beggar. Every day, Bartimaeus would have been taken out of Jericho and joined the other beggars another day to sit there and beg. The son of Timaeus was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it, was, that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said. It's amazing when you think of the Lord Jesus stopping. Remember week two, he who was fully God and fully man. Such a compassionate saviour, the creator, the sustainer of everything, stops at the cry of a blind beggar. And he said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? I wonder how we would answer that question today. How would you answer if the Lord Jesus is saying to you, and what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. It's interesting that he didn't go back into Jericho. He didn't go and tell everyone, look, I've received my sight. He was so captivated by the Lord Jesus, it says he followed him on the way. He became a follower of the Lord Jesus. And that's blind Bartimaeus now sees, and it's wow, it is indeed amazing. The purpose of Jesus' miracles was to prove that he was the Messiah. He was showing them he was, he was the Messiah. He was the king. He was showing the power of God. He was helping those in need to bring people to believe in him and to glorify God. And what we're thinking about today in the life of Christ is the unique life of the Lord Jesus. I'll read these words in Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Hebrews is another book in the New Testament, says who is holy, harmless, and undefiled. The unique, perfect life of the Lord Jesus, behind the scenes or publicly, these 30 years in Nazareth, then the three to four years in public ministry in Capernaum. There was nothing apart in the Lord Jesus' life of sin. He was sinless. He did no sin, and him sin was not. There was no sin in the Lord Jesus. In the Times magazine on Saturday, the front of it said, Wife's mistress's lies betrayal, the secret life of John Le Carr. Every single one of us have sinned. Every single one of us needs a savior. But when we look at the life of the Lord Jesus, it is indeed a unique life. And yet the end of this unique life of Christ, he wasn't handed honors, he wasn't given accolades or acclaimed or anything like that. At the end of such a beautiful, unique life, 
He was given a cross in Jerusalem and he was crucified between two malefactors. How and why we will discover next week when we come to find out why the Lord Jesus Christ died such an excruciating death. So what was the Lord Jesus wanting when he was teaching and performing miracles? He wanted men and women to repent of their sins. He wanted for people to believe in him, to trust him. He wanted them to become his followers, to become his disciples. He wanted them to serve him. He wanted others, he wanted to, them to go and to tell others about him. To be willing to give everything. And that was the case with many of, with some of them, is that some of them, their willingness to give everything cost them their lives. And that is the same today. As we see here, today the Lord Jesus is still wanting. He wants men and women to repent of their sins, to, ha- to be saved, to have a conversion experience, for people to believe in him, to turn us. Not only repentance, uh, being acknowledging I am a sinner, it's to believe on him, to become his followers, to become his disciples, to be a follower of the Lord Jesus, to show in our lives that we are Christians and to serve him because God has got something for each of us to do and to tell others about him and to be willing to give everything. That's what the Lord Jesus wants from us, the willingness to surrender our all, to live and to serve him. And in his life, It says in Peter, he's left us a model that we can follow. So the life of the Lord Jesus and the study of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, as we study the life in the Gospels, the Holy Spirit enables us to live out the things that the Lord Jesus wants us to live out. My encouragement for you is this, is to read your Bible. And if you want to start reading one book and you maybe wonder where should I start, start in Mark's Gospel and read through Mark. It's the shortest of the Gospels. And just again, pray as you read through it, the Lord will help you to understand it. And just be amazed, just stand in awe of such a unique person as the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you've got questions to ask or things that you're puzzled, my email is at the end of this, so send us an email and ask questions. But be amazed at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening.